And Sue Cook with this month's edition of Crime Watch UK. Hello, good evening. You may recall the remarkable courage of a victim of sexual assault who appeared here on the programme back in March, appealing for help to find her attacker. She'd been waylaid on a golf course and was saved by a golf player who heard her cries. Her assailant fled, leaving behind a mountain bike. Well, we can now reveal that two men were so moved by the victim's appeal that they identified their own brother as the offender. They'd had suspicion since the programme, but they hadn't seen him for weeks. And then one night he turned up covered in mud after an attack on another woman. After a struggle, they persuaded him to give himself up. Last week at Manchester Crown Court, a man pleaded guilty to no fewer than 17 serious sexual assaults and was given three life sentences. We'll have more progress to report on other cases later in the programme. Our first film tonight is a murder case. John Reynolds lived with his wife Alison and two children near the village of Rushton in Northamptonshire. On Monday the 18th of October he was killed. No one who knew John can understand why anybody should want to murder him, but there's little doubt that someone wanted him dead. Our reconstruction begins the week before his death. Somebody had been looking to buy a second-hand low-powered motorcycle. A Kawasaki Z200 was advertised in the 5th of October edition of the London small ads magazine, Loot. Yeah, 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 it's still available. There's a Kawasaki Z200, yeah. Well, I'm in Deptford. Did it take you long to get here? No, it only took me 20 minutes. I came through the dark tunnel. All oh, right, well, this is the bike. Yeah, I remember and the night he came round to buy the bike because it was the night of the Eubank fight. Didn't seem the sort of guy to be buying a bike, you know. He spoke quite well. And seem to know what exactly what he wanted. It's reliable though. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll start it up for you. Yeah, yeah. He's about, I'd say, early thirties, five eleven to six foot tall, blonde hair. He was uh, effeminate from his actions. How much do you want for it? Well, 180 pounds and no offers is what I advertised. I'll give you 150. Cash. All right. As there's no papers or anything, go on. John Reynolds was a property developer in Rushton. He ran two businesses, buying land for development as well as renovating old houses. John was good at his job and considered to be a tough but fair businessman. Right, let's do it. Right. Roy, change the plan. A few miles away near Rushton town centre. We're in Portsley Road and seen a bloke trying to start his bike. He had difficulty, so I went over and asked who he wanted a hand. Oh, mate. Having trouble starting it? No, I always have trouble starting it when it's cold. Been standing long? Well, overnight, that's all. Uh, yeah, I'd say the bloke didn't no, really know what he was doing, the way he was trying to start the bike. I'd say we're about 30, 5 foot 11, with no real strong action at all. Run back on. And try it should start then. Okay. Yeah, start. The bike was identical to the one that had been sold in Deptford, but the frame and panniers had been re-sprayed black. It had been seen throughout the past week parked here in Pitchley Road, four miles from where John Reynolds lived with his wife and family. Oh, How's it going? Great. Well, just finishing the drawing off. What do you think? Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. John lived for his work. He thoroughly enjoyed it. It was never a chore, it was more a hobby. And uh, he used to say how lucky he was doing something he really enjoyed. We got married 18 years ago 
And he was just a complete happy family man. That's all you can say about him, really. He was cheerful, kind, and just a very bright, sort of sparky person. It's Sunday, the 17th of October. This man was coming back from a fishing trip a few miles south of Rushton. It was shortly before 11 a.m. when I was approaching the A6 road junction. I saw a red Audi approaching me from the right, followed by a motorbike. They were driving very near to each other, but the motorbike attracted my attention because of the big white fairings. After following the vehicles for a couple of miles, it became plainly obvious that they were together and seeing how near the bike was constantly being driven to, to the Audi, I thought these two are obviously up to something. And the Audi turned right and he indicated right. The driver of the motorbike didn't indicate, didn't even look round and followed almost as if he was a trailer being towed by the Audi. The road they had turned into was Avenue Road, where John Reynolds lived. All right, love. The kid's up yet? Yeah? Don't think so. Oh, go and give a shout. Marcus, you up yet? Yeah? It's the next day, Monday the 18th of October. Uh, no, thanks, Tom. Oh, crumbs, it's ten past eight. I'll go and grab the docks, OK? Oh. Yeah, okay, love. Oh, John. Yeah. Do you want any gloves? Oh, yes, please, yeah. Okay, Thanks. Right. Holly, have a good day at school, love. Be good. Yeah, see you later then, Dad. Bye. Yeah, bye, darling. Bye. Right, Thanks, see you soon. Yeah, bye. Bye. Come on. There was nothing out of the ordinary. It was a typical morning. John went off as he's gone off hundreds of times before. Hiya, Robert. How are you? Not so bad. How are you, John? I've got a couple of houses down in Rushton that I'm uh, renovating. We've got... Um, Got the surveyor coming this morning, have a look at one of them, so that might move. Oh, so somehow I'm moving in. Yeah. Mind you, the old girl wants a kitchen change now, so. Anyway, better get off, because right. I've got this uh, okay. appointment. Nice right. to see you, though. And you. Take Bye. care. A gardener was arriving for work at the old people's home in Avenue Road. As I pulled in, I looked up, and I saw the guy standing on the corner looking down the lane. My natural reaction was, what's he doing on my bloody grass? You know, he's got all the pavement to walk on, hasn't he? He walked back down to the bike like I didn't exist. And it was the way the guy moved. He, he walked with a purpose, he was like a cat. I should say he was an ex-serviceman. I thought, bugger, that's close. You know, it's a bit close for comfort for shooting rabbits or something. Mum, the dogs are loose. Well, where's your dad? I'll just go and check. I knew that something was wrong because John would never have let the dogs go. I rushed outside and got into my car and just flew up the road and then I came to Hyme Park Lane and I could see our other dog sitting on the corner again with her collar and lead on and my heart was in my mouth I knew something was so wrong and I pulled in and that's when I saw Marcus on the ground with my husband and he was just lying there and I shouted to him, what's happened? And he said, I think he's dead. I think he's dead. 
Well, DCI Cross, the overwhelming question is why? This was a deliberate killing. Why would anybody want to kill him? John was very much a family man. His loves in life were his family and his work, and as the film says, his work was his hobby. We've been unable at present to establish a motive for his murder. Completely baffling. The motorbike was abandoned after John was shot. What clues have you got from that? Yeah, the motorcycle was a Kawasaki Z200, uh, found abandoned in Pikesley Road on Tuesday the 19th of October. The strange thing about that was that the bike was chained up and abandoned. There were, we've had a number of sightings of that bike between the 11th and the 19th of October in Pikesley Road, and we very much believe that the person using that bike was living locally, and we'd like to hear from anybody who saw the bike either on the 18th of October, the morning of the murder, or at any time in the week prior. And where would he have gone after he'd abandoned the bike? We believe after he abandoned the bike, he uh, was a passenger in a red Audi that shot out of Pikesley Road into the Wellingborough at about 8.40, 8.50am on the morning of the murder. There were three people in the Audi and the rear passenger was a blonde-haired individual. Now that blonde-haired individual has a rather similar description to the man uh, the witness described who bought the bike in Deptford. Yes, that's right. This uh, blonde individual, about 5 foot 11 inches tall, about 30 years old, a uh, well-spoken individual with a southern accent who at the time he bought the bike in Deptford had an expensive, loose-fitting white silk shirt on. And he may have contacted other advertisers, this man, in search of a bike? Yes, indeed, and we're interested if he did contact other um, advertisers that they get in touch with us. Have a look at their photo fit, see if they know him, if he uh, contacted them more. If anybody visits him in a red Audi, then we're anxious to connect the Audi, the bike and the photo fit. And if you saw strangers near Avenue Road that Monday morning, the 18th of October, or on the day before, if you know anything at all that just might help, please do ring us. Here in the studio, we're on 0500 600 600, or you can contact DCI Cross's colleagues direct. That number's 0604 703 503. That's 0604, the code for Northampton, 703 503. Photo call last month has so far yielded only one arrest. The man, bottom right in the album, was wanted in connection with a series of deceptions which money was obtained from women. At the night of the programme, a man phoned the police in uh, Sunderland and asked them to meet him on a street corner. They did, and he was subsequently arrested and charged with five offences. Let's change to this month's gallery of faces and hear a Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames to take us through December's photo call. Avtar Singh was last seen two months ago in Drongan, Scotland. Strathclyde police urgently need to speak to him in connection with a murder. On the 4th of October, outside the Arman Brasserie in Seafield Road Air, a fight broke out in the early hours of the morning. And Zar Shah was stabbed. He was a 36-year-old family man who worked at the restaurant. We believe Avtar Singh may have vital information. Mr. Singh is probably better known as Tony Singh and sometimes uses the family name Dari. It's thought he may now be living in London or the West Midlands. If you have any information as to his whereabouts, we'd like to hear from you. Do you recognise this man? If so, you might be able to help Hertfordshire police solve a violent attack. In January this year, the man attempted to use a stolen credit card at a clothing shop in St Albans. When he tried to pay for his goods, staff became suspicious and the manager tried to detain him. Moments later, outside the shop, the manager was severely beaten, suffering head injuries and broken ribs. The attack fled, but where is he now? He's in his mid-twenties, five foot eight and of medium build with cropped dark hair. He has a London accent. If you know him, please ring us now. Our colleagues in Manchester need your help to find this man, 62-year-old Frank Embury. They would like to speak to him in connection with a number of serious sexual offences. Between January 1989 and October 1990, eight young girls were indecently assaulted in the Withenshaw and Brooklands area of South Manchester. Their mothers had been targeted by a man who, after gaining their trust, indecently assaulted their daughters. Frank Embury is five foot seven of medium build with receding brown hair. He could have changed his appearance. He may now have a beard. He sometimes wears a hat and perhaps he's no longer wearing glasses. If you know where he is, please call. If you run an employment agency, you may have come across this man, John Dempsey Blackstock. Colleagues from three forces would like to speak to him in connection with a series of thefts and deceptions. On Friday the 12th of November, a Booker's Wholesale Foods lorry was driven away from their Maidstone depot but failed to reach its destination in Surrey. It was found abandoned later the same day on the A249 near Maidstone, minus its load of beers, wines and cigarettes. John Blackstock is 35, 5 foot 7 with a Scottish accent. He has a tattoo of a swallow on his left hand and also uses the names John Wilson and Andrew Phillips. 
He may be driving a blue Range Rover estate, similar to this one. Registration number F835DUH. If you can help with this or any of our other photo call cases, please call us tonight. Let me remind you of the free call number here in the studio, 0500 600 600. That's 0500 600 600. Now, we had a total of 800 calls on our reconstructions last month, and detectives on each case are pleased with the new information they've got to work on as a result. On the post office robbery, uh, post office van robbery in Sutton Coldfield, you might remember one of the guards was shot point blank. Several names were offered, which seemed to match with information the police already had, so there should be some news before too long on that case. And similarly, with the murder of publican Trevor Thomas in Brentford in West London. No, no. Names given by Crime Watch viewers just might fit in with information already in the system. The majority of our calls, though, were on that series of particularly violent rapes in South London. One of the callers was a woman who seems very likely to have been a victim of the same attacker, and police now feel it's just a matter of time and hard work before he's caught. Meanwhile, these two items are connected to those rapes. Two years ago, a tin, a small tin, matching this tray was stolen. It's a round tin, about six inches in diameter, and I gather quite an unusual design, this. Um, seven Audio cassettes also at the same time were stolen. They're like this. It's quite an unusual sort of packaging. Uh, it's distinctive because they, they feature various Western chart-topping artists. If you've seen anything like this, please do call us. And on the tragic case of James Bulger. Now the murder trial is over, we can reveal the involvement of Crime Watch viewers in helping to identify the two culprits. A viewer, in fact, identified one of the boys. Then two others came forward to say that they'd actually seen James being mistreated. These witnesses proved to be crucial to the investigation and may have made all the difference in securing a verdict of murder as opposed to a lesser one of manslaughter. They certainly saved thousands of hours of police time and shortened the whole agonising episode. Detective Superintendent Albert Kirby has asked us to pass on his thanks to all those Crime Watch viewers who called. And uh, we also have news on a case that we featured 18 months ago, the murder of businessman John Shippey. He was abducted in the early hours of the morning after coming home from an evening out with friends. During the programme, we were given the name of a suspect, and as a direct result of that, a man was arrested. Two days ago, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Our next case is an armed robbery on a security van in Shropshire. It was so meticulously planned and so efficiently carried out that police are convinced that the gang responsible has committed robberies like this before. There are striking similarities with at least two other security van raids over the past five years. Several weeks of planning went into the elaborate getaway route across Shropshire countryside. Our reconstruction begins in Shropshire at Benthall, which is a small community outside the town of Brosley and where the Larkin family runs a small market garden business. Brosley's a quiet sort of town where everybody seems to know everybody. It's always cleared. This area, so we're prepared for the yeah. We've been here seven years, and in that time we've got to lower a lot of people. And particularly with our lane, we noticed quite a few people up and down, and anything unusual, you know, it seems to stick out. Hi, Jack, how you doing? Oh, not too bad, Patrick, and you? Something unusual was noticed in August when the Larkin's son, Patrick, was chatting to a neighbour, and a light-coloured van came along the lane. The van of Bedford Rascal had the name Jardinaire printed on the side, which is a gardening centre which is about 20 miles from our home. And I thought, that's odd. It shouldn't be up here delivering. Fifteen minutes later, the van passed by again, this time heading back towards Brosley. In fact, Patrick saw the van three times that day. I'll give you an answer, that girl. Two miles away and three weeks later, the van was in the area again. Two forestry workers saw it near Woolly Pools, this time closely followed by another dark-coloured van. We can tell a strange vehicle, more or less straight away. We, we know all the local people and all the local vehicles. The chap in the rascal van shielded his face as he got to us, and uh, the bloke following in the escort van it was a coloured fellow, and he just didn't bother, he just drove by. It was only the uh, man in the rascal man shielding his face that made us at all suspicious. A few days after that, on September the 20th, villagers in Brosley itself were noticing strangers, this time in a beige-coloured rover parked opposite the greengrocer. 
having worked there like for sort of eight years, you tend to get to know the people that walk up and down the street because of the same faces day in, day out. Okay. Oh, look at them four men lying no. there. Oh, I don't know then. One chappy that got into the front passenger side started staring at me in a very sort of unusual manner. I mean, the whole time he was he was staring at me. I didn't in the end take the registration number of the car because I was watching this chap. The next day, it's 10.45 and Lloyd's Bank in Brosley are expecting a delivery. Ah, oh, look at that. I don't know where you're going to park, Kevin. Oh, I tell you what, look, it, it park opposite. Look, we'll, we'll put it behind that van. OK. Uh, are you happy about that van? Yeah, there's nobody in it. Has Mick told control we're here? Yes, he has. It's all right, I'll, uh, I'll check it out properly when I get out. I came out to empty my bucket into the street and something just wasn't quite right. Then, as I looked, I could see a man lying face down on the floor behind the van. And the next thing, he just disappeared. The security van drove off down Barber's Road, followed by the little white van. The only thing that was left when they were gone was the security man's helmet lying in, in the road. As the robbers turned right down Barrett Hill, they appeared to be sticking to a well-worked-out getaway route. That's it. Just keep driving down there. That's it. Don't look at me. All right, all right. Just further down there. Inside the rascal van, the security guard was being put through a traumatic ordeal at the hands of one of the robbers. I was thinking all sorts of things as my hands were tied behind my back. I thought they were just going to throw me out of a moving vehicle. And I was thinking, well, what the hell's going to happen here? And I hadn't got a clue where my truck had gone and my crew had gone and, and the cash had gone. I, hadn't got a, I didn't know what was happening. Get your head down! I can't, I can't breathe! I can't breathe! It, it was a frightening experience. Terrifying. As they turned left into Lodge Lane, the security van's driver was able for the first time to see that the rascal van was following. This turning is just a few hundred yards from the Larkins' house. There's a lot of good the lane, Pat. This is a security van. It just automatically appeared to me that it was a robbery, uh, the way the two were connected, so very close to one another, uh, the speed they were doing. I think that's a robbery, Patrick. I think we better phone the police. We better check first. I'll go have a coming boy. You be careful now. When I got out of the van at the field, I could see my security truck actually bugged down in the field for some reason. I thought he was going to shoot me out. He doesn't need me. He's got my truck. This way. Come on. Stop. Come on. I could hear my guard in the back up. At that time, a couple of times, I was thinking, well, I'm no use to him now. None of us are. And at that time, I thought, well, he's going to shoot. Don't look at me. Don't you look at me. Go, let's go. Seeing the guards apparently unharmed, but assuming the robbers were still close by, Patrick sensibly decided to go back home and get his father to call the police. In fact, the rascal van would have been about two miles away by now, heading towards Willie Estates. Unknown to the robbers, a police helicopter was already searching for them. Air One uh, YK observations, please, for a rascal van. Beige in colour, subject of an armed robbery, Embrosley. Received Air One, over. The rascal was dumped a few yards from Willie Pools, where the forestry workers had seen it only seven days earlier. Well, I'm off the nine. I'm already late. It's 20 past 11. I'll see you later. Just two miles away from there, the greengrocer was just leaving home. It's half an hour now since the robbery took place. I had to come into Brosley to work at about 11.20, and as I came around the lane in my car, 
I had sort of turned around a corner and in my rear view mirror I caught sight of a vehicle parked up uh, in the field. I was in a hurry so I couldn't stop um, but it was a strange place to have parked, it had rained heavy that night, it was parked on the field and I just thought that it was the same car that I'd seen the day before. Police believe the Rover was a switch vehicle for the robbers, along with the blue escort van which a local farmer saw driving across the field. The two forestry workers and the police found the rascal van in flames. We'll start with that rascal van, D.I. Pleasure. It had been stolen by the company, um, it had been sold rather, by the company called Jardinieri um, sometime before the robbery. Yes, it was. It was sold on the 12th of March at the ADT car auctions. We've no idea where it has been since that date. Uh, the first sighting we have is the 24th of August. We'd very much like to find out where it was after the 12th of March. Now, that van was a beige coloured van. Jardinieri now use white coloured vans. That's, that's quite right, yes. So you only want to hear about the beige, the beige right. coloured van. There were also two different people seen driving that van in the months before the robbery. Yes, that's right. On the morning of the 24th of August, which is exactly four weeks before the robbery, we see we have the van being driven on the outskirts of Broseley by a man in his late 30s. He's got uh, light brown hair, um, quite a large man. And then on the morning of the robbery, we have the van being driven by a similarly described man, um, again large build, of similar age, but going bald on top. A similar description, so they may be related. Or... They could be, or indeed it may be one and the same man. Then there was the man driving the blue Ford Escort van, which was seen following the rascal van. Yes, this was on the Tuesday prior to the robbery, uh, near Willie Pools, and this is described as an Afro-Caribbean man, aged about 25 years, with close-cropped dark hair. And there was a blue Ford Escort van seen on the day of the robbery itself? Yes, we're most interested in, in, in this vehicle. It was seen parked only some 100 yards from where the Bedford Rascal van was subsequently burned out. It's described as a blue Ford Escort van and it was um, written on the side PJ Products Limited or something very similar to that. The P may have been a B or an R. We're very, very keen to trace this vehicle, as we have not yet been able to do so. So any firm who recognises it as a van they may, they may have had, please do contact us. Actually, some people say the van might have been green. Yes, there has been talk of a green van, blue or green. It's mm. more than likely it's one in the same vehicle. Do you know where that blue van went after it was seen in the field? No, after that it went over the river on the Apley Bridge and into the Apley Estate. The only way off that estate is onto the... Uh, Telford Road, it could have gone anywhere after that. We we're desperate to find where it went after there. Right, well there's a substantial reward on offer. If you can help us, you can ring us now on 0500 600 600 or you can call the West Mercia Police Direct on 0952 290 888. That's 0952, the code for Telford, 290 888. Well, let's just quickly very bring you up to date with what we've got so far on the John Reynolds murder. We've got a tremendous number of calls. We really have. We've got several names that the officers haven't had yet a chance to evaluate them. And we might have had some very important information on that. Tremendous results, too, so far, at least so it appears, on every one of the photo call cases. Now, uh, here with the, this month's incident desk, our Detective Constable Jackie Ames and Superintendent David Hatcher. My Ken colleagues need your help to find the driver who killed 18-year-old Jason Dookie. On Tuesday the 12th of October, Jason had spent the evening in Tunbridge Wells with friends and was walking home along Ferndale at about 11.35pm when he was hit by a car. He died from his injuries three days later. Shortly after the accident, a red car stopped in the middle of the road, near to where Jason was hit. The car door was open and a passing motorist saw a man quickly get inside and drive off. She thinks the car was either a Ford Fiesta or Metro van, which was totally tatty and about five years old. She also recalls seeing a man walking his dog only yards from the scene. Now he was about 50 with greying hair and we desperately need him to come forward. Jason had just started his first job working as an office junior and had his whole life ahead of him. If you can help with this tragic case please ring the incident room in Tunbridge Wells on 0892 502 126. If you're a courier in central London, you might be able to help us solve an intriguing fraud. On May the 25th, a courier was sent to the Royal Bank of Scotland in Charing Cross to collect some pre-ordered dollars. The letter authorising the withdrawal was a fraud. Three days later, on May 28th, another courier was sent to the same bank to collect some dollars and again the letter he had with him was a fraud. 
Police would like to speak to the two couriers because they may have valuable information which could lead to the people responsible. If you have any information, you can phone the incident room on 071 321 7618. Can you help Exeter Police find this rapist? On Wednesday, July the 14th at 6.45pm in Ludwell Valley, a woman out walking was threatened with a knife and raped. Two weeks later, the same man approached a woman in Salmon Pool Lane area. Luckily, she'd noticed him following her, so she managed to escape. Unfortunately, only last month, he claimed another victim, this time in the Ducks Marsh area of Exeter. She was out walking her dog on Friday afternoon, November 12th. Exeter police desperately need your help. So do you recognise this man? He's between 20 and 30, with mousy hair and a distinctive nose. He was also wearing boots like these. They're brown suede desert boots. If you can help in any way, please ring the Exeter Police on 0392 451 634. Or of course you can call us here on any of those cases. That's 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600. Some crimes, like the murder of Rachel Nickell or the abduction of James Bulger, capture the public's imagination and touch the nation's heart. Our next case is one that's had relatively little national publicity and yet deserves a great deal more. It happened six weeks ago on the outskirts of Wakefield in West Yorkshire. Our Crime Watch reconstruction only hints at the physical violence. We hope to prompt the recollection of potential witnesses who might not have understood the implications of what they saw that night and, frankly, to prompt the consciences of those who know who the killers are. Hello, what's this? I thought you were going down to the job centre today. I am. This is the latest fashion. I thought I might go dressed like this to get me noticed. <laughs> go on, look. Let's see if there's any jobs in there. Here. Tell. There you are. There's that one. Well, that's no good. You need word processing. Yeah, well, I might as well write for it. I mean, I've written enough. That last letter I did was really good. I'm surprised I didn't get an interview for that. Yeah, all right, if you want to. Julia was keen to work. That she one? wrote an awful lot of letters. Oh, that's Not all jobs replied to her, unfortunately. Uh, and that used to upset her a little bit that she'd put the effort in. Uh, but it never disheartened her. Mm, she it... bounced back. I always thought that the best job for Julia would be in fashion because she had a very canny knack of picking up bargain. No, but you could wear that body that she really She loved clothes. Them. Julia always wanted to look smart. Hey, sis! You'll be pleased to know I'm not borrowing your top tonight. Yeah, but I bet you've raided my mum's wardrobe. I don't know why you always have a dig at me. I always wash and iron your stuff and put it back. If you really want to know, my mate Sarah lent me some money for a new outfit. What do you think? It's nice, that. Huh? Hi, Mum. Hi, love. Are you up out again? Yeah, I am. Where are you going tonight? Going around town. Yeah, I met up with Sarah at lunchtime. Thought we'd go out for a drink. Sis! Can I borrow your mascara? Julia loved life, yes. She, uh, she packed a lot of, lot of fun into those 18 years. And... She had a tremendous zest for life, did Julia. Hiya, Julia. Hiya. Hiya. Yeah, in a bit. I can't get me out to go in. Oh, I said you would, didn't I? Oh, I've yeah. got a spot. I've yeah. tried to cover it up. Oh, nobody's going to see that thing. You think? Yeah. Oh, it'll have to do. Hang on, I'll just say bye to your mum. Right, mum, I'm off. What do I look like? All right. You look lovely. Are you going to be late? Should be in about two-ish. OK. All right, see you later. Have you got your keys? Yes, I've got me keys. Ta-ra. Bye, mum. Julia and her friend Sarah had spent the night in several clubs and pubs in the Westgate area of Wakefield. As they were leaving at 2am, they met an ex-boyfriend of Sarah's, and Julia was none too pleased. Julia resigned herself to going home alone. Look, if you want to go off with him, that's fine. Go on. But can you lend me some money for a taxi? Only I haven't got any. 
Here, I'll lend you a fiver. Oh, thanks ever so much. Are you sure you're going to be all right? Yeah, I'll be all right. Well, look, we'll walk it at Taxi Rang. Look, I'm a big girl now. I'll be all right. I'll see you tomorrow. ta Julia didn't get a taxi. For some reason, perhaps to save the money, she decided to walk home. We always told Julia that uh, if she missed the bus or uh, she run out of money for a taxi, she must ring home. This was impressed on her from a very early age. And Julia's always done that many times. It's just completely out of character for her to walk home. Julia's five mile journey home to Crofton would have been a long and lonely walk at three in the morning. Several people recall seeing her, noticing she was barefooted and wearing thin clothes for such a cold night. This lorry driver and his wife remember Julia, and someone else out late that night. We saw a man walking on his own. Further along the road, we saw a young girl. She didn't look to be panicking. She wasn't looking over her shoulder. She was just looked as if she was walking home. A few minutes later, a local resident in Doncaster Road remembers seeing a young woman talking to someone outside the Stoneley Hotel. It's now around 3.30. Hello. Hiya, it's Julia. Julia, what are you doing ringing at this time in the morning? I don't even think Sarah's in yet. I don't think she's in. All right, bye. No one knows why Julia called Sarah or where she found a phone. Was it this box in Montague Street just down from the Stoneley Hotel? Or was it from somebody's house? And who was it who woke a resident in nearby Gordon Street? Two hours later, around 5.45 a.m., Julia was somehow back on the Doncaster Road, where a motorist saw her in the company of three people. They looked like they'd been out all night. I got a good look at the first girl. She was about five foot six, light coloured hair, short cropped at sides, could have been dyed. It didn't look a natural colour. As the couple walked past, unsteady, I saw another girl. As she came round the car, she actually looked as if she was going to ask me for assistance. At that point, I looked to my left again, and I noticed another chap. He walked very slowly, looking at me all the time. This bloke looked to be about five foot ten, very well built, muscular, dark complexion. As the driver pulled away, the group appeared to be having a heated discussion. But not long afterwards, when another motorist saw Julia, what he witnessed was a great deal more disturbing. No, Julia was found dead two days later on waste ground at the end of Montague Street. If you were the girl who saw her being beaten, her family are desperate for you to put right what you can. She may be frightened to come forward or maybe frightened of the, the boyfriend or... But I wish she would come forward and, and give the police all the pressure she can. I would say that whichever of the people come forward, the police will see them at any time, at any place, anywhere, and until we apprehend the person or persons concerned, we can't lay our daughter to rest. And, of course, you will see anybody anywhere, anytime, and in confidence, but, I mean, this was an astonishing attack. It's certainly the worst one that I've ever had to deal with. It's a young girl, a lovely young girl, who made the mistake of walking home that morning. Um, another attack, so she was badly beaten and suffered a, a long sexual attack. Now, there are going to be many people in their hearts who want to help on this one. Um, I mean, obviously, the other girl there, the, the other young woman in that foursome, assuming this, it was Julia, and there's every reason to suppose it was in the six o'clock sighting, she actually tried to save her, it seems. That would, it, from the witnesses, she was very upset, and she was uh, upset at seeing the, the men hit her. Uh, I can't assure her of her safety until she comes forward. I'm worried for her safety. I want her to come forward, 
um, but I can only make sure she is safe once she has come forward. Now you've got a very good description of her. Yes we have, she's described by one of the witnesses who saw quite clearly as being about 17 to 22. She's uh, a well-built girl and she had this distinctive hairstyle which was cut short at the back and at the sides. And look how distinctive these e-fits are. This is how one witness described her. Now look at the next one. And of course, they haven't seen each other's uh, drawings, each other's descriptions. They're very, very striking there. And a good description of the young man as well who tried to stare out the car driver. Yes, he's uh, described as a little older. He's uh, 21 to 26, quite tall, 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, muscular build uh, with short, fair hair. And he's described as looking hard, a hard-looking man, but someone who would be attractive to women. And probably a lot of people will have seen this group in the Agbrig area because, I mean, they were somewhere around there from, what, 3.30 in the morning until 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning? Well, it could have been as late as 8 a.m. because uh, certainly we, we know Julia was there walking home at 3.30. We don't know what's happened to her since. If um, she's met someone who she knew or she's come across someone, she's been in that area, and that's the important thing. She's been in the Agbrig area from about half past three until about 6.30. This is the early morning of Friday the 29th of October. Of course, rather than walking around the streets, she could have been in somebody's house. Yes, it's more likely that she was in someone's house. and It's, it's important that uh, anyone that's got information about a party next door, or, uh, movement next door, or anyone that fits the descriptions, they've got to come forward. Now, she could have been in a white van too. Tell us why this is so crucial. There's a sighting of a white van, nearly well, getting on for four o'clock. Yes, like we that. do have the, the screams, as was shown in the film. If, if someone was running up that street, they would eventually go into Montague Street, which is the street where Julia's body was found. A van was seen driving up that street uh, just before 4 a.m. It's distinctive and as much as someone, a commercial bodybuilder, would know that vehicle if he saw it, it's about a four transit in size. But the, the distinctive thing about it, it's white, but the, the roller shutter doors and the stanchions at the side, they're unpainted. Um, Aluminium shutter, very, very distinctive. There won't be many like that. It's a diesel truck, we think, a diesel van. There's a £5,000 reward, incidentally, as though that was necessary. Here's the number, 0500 600 600. Please call us. It's a free call number here to the studio. Or you can ring the Wakefield room on a free phone number there, 0800 318 001. That's free phone, 0800 318 001. And there are lines here free now, so please do call if you can. Um, we're getting a lot of calls uh, on uh, each of our four photo call cases. We've got a name for the man who shot John Reynolds. We're checking that one out. And a police officer has called with some inf interesting information on the security van robbery in Shropshire. Incidentally, we asked for some help with the RP on the Exeter rapes. We're asking for a tin with this design on it, not this tray. And uh, our lines are open till midnight, so please do call if you can. We will We're actually going to have more to tell you, um, uh, hopefully, on our update, which is going to be at 11 o'clock, rather earlier than usual. Before we go, let me remind you of the findings of this, the latest British Crime Survey, which shatters many myths. It's very authoritative. No fewer than 12,000 people throughout Britain took part in the survey, and they paint a much more accurate and vivid picture than raw police statistics. For a start, they say... We're much more likely to report offences now than we were 10 years ago, especially domestic violence and minor theft. Yet brutal crimes by strangers, the very sort that we feature most here on Crime Watch, show no increase at all since the surveys first started in 1981. So do be reassured that what you've seen tonight really is rare. Don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Fly away alone, sometimes you don't come back.